All right, we have uh, another keynote coming up. So um, uh, Mr. George Quinn is a researcher at the National Institute of um, Standards and Technology. He has been involved in various uh, biometric technology evaluations, including the face recognition vendor test, the, the, the evaluation of latent fingerprint technology, and the multiple biometrics evaluation, uh, still face test. He currently leads the latest iteration of the IRIS Interoperability Exchange Program, IREX. Uh, his research uh, interests include biometric sample quality, biometric fusion, and statistical computing. So, you know, we're very pleased that somebody with so much experience can come mm -hmm. and give this talk. So, um, I'll turn it over to, uh, to, to George. Thanks for that intro. Uh, thanks for sticking around, even though I think you might be sticking around for the uh, runner-up award, so I don't blame you for it. But <laughs> All right, so I'll be speaking about multispectral iris recognition, which in a nutshell just means comparing iris samples acquired at different illumination wavelengths. Uh, how does this work? Ah, gotcha. Ah, sweet. All right, so, but before I get into that, I just wanted to briefly lay the groundwork for iris recognition. So, it's pretty run of the mill as far as most biometrics are concerned. You start by acquiring an iris sample, often just with a handheld iris camera like this, or maybe with an iris kiosk. And they generally require more active cooperation from the user than like say, acquiring a face image, so it does require a bit of habituation, but it's not a major inconvenience overall. In fact, the whole point of these airport kiosks is to expedite the whole check-in process and make it more convenient. So you acquire a sample, and then actually most, almost all cameras nowadays, they acquire samples of both eyes concurrently, both the left and the right eye. And the first processing step is to localize the iris boundaries the outer limbus boundary and the inner pupil boundary. And uh, you tend to mask the eyelids if they so happen to trespass over the, the iris texture. And then you create a matchable template. Uh, after extracting the features, you use that to create a matchable template. So the iris code is the most uh, popular format developed by John Dogman, but it's not necessarily the only one. And since nearly all deployed iris recognition systems are one-to-many as opposed to one-to-one. -one. The template usually gets searched against uh, an enrollment database of previously enrolled identities, and then the decision is returned, namely, is this person enrolled, and if so, what's their identity? So from the perspective of the user being enrolled, it can be either good or it can be bad. So if this is an access control system, say it grants you uh, building access, and the person is correctly found in there, then that's good, everything's hunky-dory, uh, nothing to write home about. But if this is like a terrorist watch list and the person is found in there, then that's pretty not good for the user. So this just highlights the difference between positive ID systems and negative ID systems. So with positive ID systems, the user makes the implicit claim that they are enrolled. Usually it's good to be enrolled because being enrolled grants you special privileges of some sort. And then with negative ID systems, um, the user's making the implicit claim that they're not enrolled. And it's usually better not to be enrolled with negative ID systems because being enrolled, the, the enrollment database usually contains lists of people to watch out for, like the UAE's uh, uh, immigration system where they have a watch list of people uh, that they know should not be granted entry into the country because they have expired visas or known criminal history or what, or what have you. So one, one other thing I wanted to point out is iris recognition is extremely accurate as long as the quality of the samples is good. So we see a lot of reports that say like, you know, accuracy is 0.9999 this and 0 0.00001 that, but that's with samples acquired in a highly controlled environment in a laboratory setting. But operationally, we often do see Samples like this, where you've got severe amounts of off axis, or the, the gaze is off axis, or there's a heavy amount of eyelid occlusion, or a high amount of motion blur. And so these kind of things may only happen a handful of times every thousand acquisitions, but it's those handful of cases that end up, end up dominating error rates. Mm 
because we've done tests with the most accurate matches and we found that for identification failures, they're usually almost always caused by stuff like this. And you definitely don't want to enroll samples like this. And by the way, the IRIX-2 report covers all the things that could possibly go wrong when acquiring an iris sample. And you can't really correct for this kind of stuff post-capture, like you can't really recover the iris texture that's behind the eyelid. So you really have to catch this stuff at the moment of capture. And in fact, a lot of iris cameras now are starting to do that. So they'll look for certain things, like they'll detect, oh, the person was blinking at the moment of capture, so let's reacquire a new sample. Let's prompt the user to present a new sample, or they'll take whatever remedial action is necessary. So that's the uh, basics of conventional iris recognition but gravitating towards the whole multispectral component. So iris recognition cameras, they acquire samples in the near infrared band between 7 and 900 nanometers. That's the wavelength, which is just outside the uh, visual perception for most people. And one of the main reasons, I say the primary reason, but I don't know for sure, but one of the, prime, one of the main reasons is because 90 or so percent of the general population has brown eyes, and brown eyes don't reflect well at visible wavelengths, which is not good. But if you look at brown eyes in the near IR, like this example here, you can usually see that a much, um, much better texture is presented. With, you know, you can see the crypts and furrows more clearly. It's much more to match there. And more generally, you can acquire the iris at any particular wavelength, or I should say like any safe and practical wavelength. And this just shows one particular iris acquired at uh, different wavelengths. So 505 nanometers is, you know, corresponds roughly to a green color. 620 is kind of like an orangey red. 650 is red, 620 is orangey red. And this just shows how the iris changes at different wavelengths. So even if you compare like 800 nanometers to 1200 nanometers, you know, the iris looks different. So right off the bat, you can kind of expect that comparing iris samples at different wavelengths, you're going to get some kind of performance hit. So why are we looking at this? Well, camera interoperability for one. Uh, different cameras acquire at different wavelengths. Although they're all required to capture within that 7 to 900 nanometer range, they don't all capture at exactly the same wavelength. Some actually capture at two different wavelengths simultaneously to sort of hedge their bets, which has a whole new dimension of the problem that we, don't, we won't get into. But also forensic applications, you know, can, namely, can we match the iris at visible wavelengths despite what I said about brown eyes? And let's see. And so we know it's possible in at least one case if you know about the story of the Afghan girl from the National Geographic uh, magazine. So she was on the cover, and it was so popular that some 28 years or so later, they, uh, they went back to Afghanistan, and they found her, and then they used her iris to verify her identity. So we know it's possible in at least one case. And thirdly, for optimal performance, so, you know, which wavelength yields the best accuracy? And, you know, is this wavelength optimal wavelength consistent across matchers. Let's see. So everything I'll be presenting from this moment forward, all the results will be from uh, the IRX-9 evaluation. So we conduct a lot of evaluations at NIST. And we don't develop the matching algorithms ourselves because we, frankly, we don't have the capability. We just announce the evaluation, we release the API, and then third parties opt to participate. So the evaluation is well underway. Uh, the submission window was um, from January, September of last year. So that was a window over which participants were allowed to submit matchers. So it's over now. We're well through our analysis, and we're currently in the process of producing a series of public reports. And this is just a list of participants. We had 13 participants submitting matching algorithms, 12 companies, and one university. So some of these companies are big, some are small, some are new to the IRIX program, some have participated in previous IRIX evaluations, 
So these 13 participants submitted a total of 46 matching algorithms, which is good because more data is good, but at the same time it can be uh, difficult to distill that much information down to an easily digestible format in our public reports. Uh, but anyway, so we had a data set that was collected specifically to test multispectral matching. It consists of about 220,000 images from 237 distinct individuals. So multiply that last number by two to get the number of unique iris, uh, irises or eye rides, although left and right eyes from the same person are likely to be correlated. And we had some ancillary metadata like eye color and ethnicity, which could prove handy during analysis. We decided to test both within wavelength and cross wavelength. So within wavelength, right, both samples are, are both of the compared samples are acquired at the same wavelength. And cross wavelength, both of the compared samples are uh, collected at possibly different wavelengths. And one more point, we manually marked up the iris boundaries because we didn't want to task the matches with having to find the iris boundaries, uh, especially at the longer wavelengths, because at longer wavelengths, the contrast of the limbus boundary here is much less defined, so traditional methods of finding the iris boundary might be not work like Dogman's Integro differentiable operator may not work at longer wavelengths because the contrast here just, just kind of disappears. So we just didn't want boundary localization to be a possible confounding factor. So anyway, we have some results. So we got FNMR on the uh, vertical axis, false non-match rate, which is just an error rate. It's kind of like a miss rate. And then we got wavelength on the uh, horizontal axis. So what we see here is that matching out accuracy tends to be better in that 7900 nanometer range, which is good because that's the range over which iris recognition currently operates. If I didn't mention already, the standard requires between 7 and 900 nanometers. And although I should mention that we only have data at the points, like this point here, this point here, and we, we're just connecting them with line segments, so the true minimum, it, it could go down like this and then up like this, or it could go down like this and then up like this. So we don't, we don't know where the actual minimum is, but we do know that as the wavelength gets longer, accuracy deteriorates pretty precipitously. As the wavelength gets shorter, the same thing happens. So if you look at the most accurate matcher at 620 nanometers, we get an FNMR of about 0.05, uh, which might sound bad, but it still means you'll hit 19 out of every 20 attempts. So that may be acceptable for some applications, even though you're not getting error rates nearly like what you'd see down here. And so by the way, that was all, um, whoops. That was all within wavelength comparison, so you know this means both sam compared samples were acquired at 800 nanometers. And this is cross wavelength, so if this is the wavelength of the first of the compared samples and this is the wavelength of the second of the compared samples, and then F and MR is indicated by color, so blue is good, red is bad. We see that roughly speaking, it's better to uh, compare samples that were acquired at similar wavelengths that are along the main diagonal here. And overall, FNMR is lowest when both samples are acquired at 800 nanometers or so. But we can look at some other stuff. So if, th by the way, this is just results for one of the most accurate matches. That's why I picked it. So if we look at 620 versus 620, we see again an FNMR of about 0.05. So that's visible to visible. And then if we look at 620 versus 800, which would be visible to near IR, that's uh, visible, yeah, visible in the eye. We see 0 0.053. So at least in this case, you can say visible to visible is comparable to visible in the IR. And uh, yeah. So you may already be aware that accuracy for any, um, or for a lot of biometric systems is sort of the trade-off between two error rates as a threshold is adjusted. Um, in fact, that's how accuracy is measured for any binary classification system. So one type of error is false non-match rate, and the other type of error is the false match rate, FMR. 
And so for iris, you kind of want just want a stable and predictable non-mated distribution. You just don't want fMR to explode for any particular combination of wavelengths. Uh, and it doesn't here, although it start it kind of gets worse at the visible wavelength quadrant here. So if you look at 800 compared to 800, and then you compare that to 620 versus 620, you get, I don't know if you can read the text, but you get a factor of 5.7 increase of the FNMR, or sorry, if of the FMR. So a 5.7 factor increase of FMR is not insignificant, but it's not catastrophic, especially for iris, because you can usually adjust the decision threshold to reduce the FMR by a good amount with only small increases in FNMR, but it, it's something to note anyway. And so I also wanted to look at uh, FNMR broken out by eye color. So we were limited by 237 individuals, that's how many people we had data for. So we had, kinda had to consolidate all the lighter eye colors into one category. So if we had gray, blue, or green, we just put that into the light category. And then anyone with brown eyes, we just put in the dark category. So this is kinda typical for a lot of the most accurate matches that we tested, where brown eyes seem to perform better in that traditional near IR range, at least between 800 and 910 nanometers. Whereas lighter color eyes match better at visible wavelengths. Although the overall minimum for both looks like it might be somewhere in the near IR, but not necessarily in exactly the same place for both uh, eye colors. And we, we've kind of seen this weird disparity where brown eyes match better than blue eyes before, or lighter eyes before, but we've never really published because we weren't sure if it was a result of some confounding factor that we're not aware of. So if you look at iris samples for lighter color eyes, they tend to have more distinctive features, like you see the crypts and furrows more clearly, and then you look at brown eyes, and they tend to look much smoother, and you think, oh, there's not much there to work with. Yet the matchers seem to have an easier time with the brown eyes. So I guess this just goes to show that um, what people look at and what the matchers look at are two different things. All right, so I also want to discuss IRIS as a forensic tool um, because this is a cross-domain workshop. So forensic science is the application of scientific knowledge and methodology to legal problems and criminal investigations. So the intersection of IRIS and forensic science is quite broad. So it could cover a whole bunch of stuff like you know courtroom interpretation of a hamming distance or like uh, manual verification of an IRIS match. Uh, but what I wanted to cover is comparing iris samples that were from, Im from images that weren't originally acquired for the purposes of iris matching. So it would be like high resolution photography or high resolution videography, or at a minimum, um, images, of the iris, images of the iris that weren't acquired um, specifically for the purpose of iris matching or, or not with a traditional iris camera. So when you switch to these so-called forensic iris samples, a whole bunch of variables are gonna change, but for starters, we thought we'd start with just two, so. One is the transition from the near IR to the visible wavelength, which we kind of already touched on, and the other is the reduced pixel resolution that we're likely to have to work with. So as far as switching over to visible wavelength matching, we already know we're gonna take a huge performance hit, so this is couple of DET curves, so if you go all the way to the left end of the curve, you see an FMR of 10 to the negative six, which is one in a million. So for near IR, you get about 0 0.002 um, FNMR, and that goes all the way up to about 0 0.08 when you switch to visible. So it's roughly a factor of 40 increase in FNMR at fixed FMR when you switch over to comparing visible uh, images which sounds bad, but again, for forensic applications, that might be tolerable, you know. An FNMR of uh, 0.08 might be tolerable. As far as the whole resolution issue, we didn't have low resolution samples to begin with, so what we did is we just downsampled the images that we had, and then we upsampled them to get them back into a format that uh, the mattress could handle. And so you might note that 
down sampling doesn't perfectly capture low resolution samples because it doesn't capture like shot noise or like the physical size of the sensor inside the camera. And also the method of interpolation might matter. We just use bilinear interpolation. But uh, for, like just for an initial investigation of the problem we thought was good enough, you know, it's like playing golf where you, you know, the first hit, you kind of just hit it in the general direction of the hole. So we're just looking for first order approximations here. And so this is comparing uh, low resolution visible spectrum samples to traditional near IR samples. And I should mention that for standard iris matching, traditional iris matching, you usually have at least 100 to 120 pixels across the iris, which would put them somewhere in this range. But what we see here is that when we match visible samples at progressively lower pixel resolutions, we see that error rate FNMR remains relatively stable until we get to iris diameters of about 48 pixels when FNMR starts to creep upward. And then by the time we get to 24 pixels across the iris, FNMR starts to break down pretty catastrophically. And then if we look at the other error, type of error, FMR, again, we just don't want it to explode or get out of control really under any conditions, and it doesn't. It starts to creep upward as the resolution decreases, but then it kind of drops pretty precipitously. So that's something to note. And this is just to point out that all the problems that we see with conventional iris recognition are also liable to cause problems with matching these so-called forensic iris samples. And so this is just an uh, example of Purkinje images that we see a lot, and uh, it's just reflections of the scene off the front or back of the cornea, which I think are, would be very difficult to detect and, and rectify in an operational system. But anyway, for forensic iris samples, we're going to have to deal with all of these issues. And we're probably also going to have to deal with uh, compression artifacts, because a lot of videos have compression artifacts. A lot of images are stored in JPEG format. We know from one of our previous evaluations, IRX3, that JPEG is pretty unforgiving as far as compressing iris samples, that the whole tiling artifacts, you get an eight by eight tiling, screws up the Gabor wavelets that screw up the feature extraction for iris recognition. Um, so if you, if you are gonna compress iris samples, you generally wanna do it with JPEG 2000, which is much more forgiving. And let's see, so I don't have any, uh, I can go backwards, so I don't have any conclusions because all this is preliminary and I didn't want to be committed to anything, but we can make some general conclusions based on what we're seeing here. So I think most of the images that you see on social media like Instagram or Facebook, they don't really have sufficient resolution to perform matching of the iris. Um, or even like Wikipedia, when you look a particular person up and you see an image of that person, we're probably going to get ir pixel diameters of the iris probably somewhere around this range where um, iris matching is, is not viable. Of course, face recognition is another issue. As far as FBI mugshot images, you know, the FBI's database over in Morgantown, uh, West Virginia, some of those images are pretty high resolution. Um, but most of them, from what I've seen, are something like 768 by 124 in pixel diameter or, or in pixel dimensions. So if you have 768 pixels across the whole head plus some space on the left and the right, you're probably not going to get that many pixels for the iris. So I'm kind of guesstimating that for FBI mugshots, you'll probably get something in this range. So for most FBI mugshot images, I would say iris matching is not viable again. And so when is it viable? I guess when you've got sufficient resolution and also when you're willing to tolerate FNMR miss rates in this range, then it would be viable. So let's see. So timeline for the IRX-9 evaluation. So the first report will be out in two to three weeks, but the first report is just sort of a baseline performance test of virus recognition. So matching technology tends to improve over time, 
So it's nice to conduct an evaluation of the current state of the art every few years just to see how the matching technology has improved since the last evaluation, and that's what this first report does. In the second report, which we're targeting sort of a July deadline for, our public, for publication, it's going to cover everything I just presented, pending changes, plus probably a bunch of other stuff. And so this final slide is just a plug for the IREX program, uh, which we conduct at NIST. So I don't remember the mission statement, but so the IREX program was initiated to support an expanded marketplace of iris-based applications, and it provides quantitative support for iris recognition standardization, development, and deployment. So the first evaluation was conducted back in 2009. It was IRIX-1. It looked at standards formats for storing the iris image. And the most recent completed one was IRIX-6. Uh, and that one looked at a possible aging effect. So the problem is if you, uh, the question is, does the iris age over time? So the way we looked at that was as the time between captures increases, does accuracy degrade in some way for mated comparisons. So th there's a carefully crafted definition of iris aging in the IRIX 6 report. But uh, the strong implication is that if there is some kind of degradation as the time between captures increases, the strong implication is that something about the iris is changing, like the, uh, the elasticity of the sphincter or dilator muscles might be changing, that changes the uh, the deformations of the fibrous tissue, or maybe the fibrous tissue is changing, or um, it's a good question for an ophthalmologist, which I'm not. Um, anyway, the evaluation found there was no significant aging effect for iris, at least up to a period of six or seven years. And the reason we can only go six to seven years is because that's the length at which we have data. Iris is kind of relatively new as a biometric. We don't have data going further back than that at least not on a large scale. And we couldn't say there is no aging effect. We could just say there's no significant aging effect because you can't really disprove a negative. But we can say if there is an aging effect, it's drowned out by 30 or 40 other more significant factors that we should think about first. And that if there is an aging effect, we can just ignore it uh, for the time being. Although I think, um, I think her name, Stephanie Shuckers from Clarkson University is collecting some longevity data to study this problem. So she's collecting fingerprints, face and iris, I think for children and maybe adults too, over a period of years to look at how these different biometrics might change over time. So it might be possible that the iris changes like between zero and two years, but then not so much between 20 and 30 years of age. So it'll be interesting to see some of those results, but it's gonna take years for, for us to get them. So that's just uh, the lowdown on the IRIX program. And you can find out more about this all on the IRIX homepage, which is iris.nis.gov slash IRIX. And that is the totality of my presentation. <laughs> all right, thank the speaker. <laughs> a very insightful talk. Uh, we have time for uh, a question, I guess, if anybody has one. Uh, Terry? I'll just yell. Um, so when you did the different wavelengths, right? How do you balance the amount of brightness? Because as you change wavelengths, the total amount of radiation coming out of the scene changes. And so with a, sh with a uh, shorter wavelength, if you integrate for a long enough period of time, the sclera may bloom and, and disappear, but maybe you can still see the iris. The sclera may bloom? Because it's, it's, it's the white. It has the most reflection. So yeah. If cameras are doing like an auto gain, they will stop when the sclera has got enough light. But you could push it past that and say, no, no, give me more integration time to get enough light back out of the iris. Right, right. I think, yeah, some cameras, they look at the widest thing in the scene and, and then use that to sort of calibrate. Uh, the answer is I have no idea because I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the acquisition of the iris samples. So that's my, <laughs> my answer. All right, so uh, thank you very much, George, for that insightful talk. Um, so now we'll move, oh, right.
Um, if you want your video to be distributed, please sign this consent form. <laughs> okay. um, so now we move on to the last portion of our um, of our agenda, which is the, the, the talks. Um, let's see, do we have the um, the folks uh, for automatic access control base? Ah, wonderful. <laughs> So um, the full title is Automatic Access Control Based on Face and Hand Biometrics in a Non-Cooperative Context. Um, yeah, we'll get it started right away. You might have to change your resolution. Uh, also fit there. 